Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first session of the guided reading of the novel The Professor by Charlotte Bronte. Great to have you here. We are starting a new literary cycle at Books and Culture. For the past upcoming weeks, we are going to discuss Charlotte Bronte, one of the most significant names in Victorian literature. And here on YouTube, I will be guiding this uh, sessions in which we'll read together and comment her book, The Professor. So let me know uh, if you're watching this live, let me know who you are, where you're watching from, and also let me know if you have, well, what do you know about Charlotte Bronte, what's your experience with her so far, if you have read any books by her yet, and if this is your first time reading The Professor. This is my first time reading The Professor, so we're going to go on this literary adventure together. We're going to explore this text uh, together. Well, if you don't know me, I would like to introduce myself before we get started. So my name is Dr. Fernanda Korowski Moura. I have a PhD in literary studies. I'm a literature teacher. I teach mainly courses on 19th and 18th century English literature. I'm passionate about these periods. I always tell my students that if I, I ever came across a time machine, I would go back to 19th, to 19th century England to see, well, talk to, or even just see, for instance, Charles Dickens, uh, the Brontes, Jane Austen a little earlier in the century, Mary Shelley, the romantic poets of the end of the, the 18th century, Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, how wonderful that will be, right? Uh, and I'm also the founder of Books and Culture, an online platform where I offer online literature courses and workshops for book lovers all over the world. Let me know if you're a student at Books and Culture, what have you studied already with me? Uh, I just love creating content. I love creating classes and lessons. And I wanted to expand my horizons. So that's why um, this is the second year of Books and Culture. And it's been going great. I just love it so much. And I'm so thankful for all the students that have hopped on board this journey with me. So, Miche is here. Hi, Miche, watching live from South Africa. Great to have you here. Miche is one of our students at the Creative Reader Academy. That's awesome. Um, and let's see what I have to talk to you about. Um, I would like to talk to you, I would like to tell you something, um, a new course that I have created for uh, Books and Culture. If you're passionate about the Brontes, you cannot miss this course. It is called Exploring Jane Eyre, A Journey into Victorian Literature. So we're going to explore and discuss Charlotte Bronte's masterpiece, Jane Eyre. This will be um, four live um, sessions, meetings. This will be exclusive for, these meetings will be exclusive for um, the students. So I want to create, I like to say a cozy, safe environment in which we can um, exchange our literary ideas, opinions, uh, impressions. These sessions will be live via Zoom. So we're going to interact uh, a lot. I always start with a little, well, a mini lecture in which I give you information about the time period, uh, in this case, Victorian England, the literature of the time, um, contextual information that is relevant for the reading experience. And uh, we'll discuss themes, the plot, characters, we'll really uh, pull out a magnifying lens and um, look at all the layers of meaning within the text um, of Jane Eyre. So if you would like to be part of this group, sign up now via booksandculture.club. You can find the information here. And um, oh yeah, the sessions are on Mondays, starting the 26th, let me just double check. Yes, the 26th of February at 5 o'clock PM Central European time. 
will be live discussing this um, um, work of art. And if you cannot make it live, you can also watch the recording. So let me know if you're excited about joining this um, this course. It's the first time that I do this live, and I think it will be very rich, a very enriching experience for those who participate. Um, and um, to continue our, or let's say, to expand our studies of Charlotte Bronte, the literary cycle at Books and Culture at the moment, um, we're also going to read together the professor here on YouTube. These sessions will happen every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central European time. It's great if you can join me live. I love communicating and interacting with you. Um, but the sessions are also recorded, so you can watch them later at your own convenience. Um, you can take a look at, um, at my Instagram at books.end.culture. If you're not following, following me there yet, do. Please do. That's where I share a lot of literary content. And I also shared the chapter schedule for this project. So which chapters exactly we're going to read in each session. For instance, today I'm going to give you an introduction to the novel and we're going to read the preface and chapter one. Are you excited? I am very excited to, to start this um, project. And I would like to know from you, think about it, if you're watching the recording or listening to this on the podcast, or if you're here live, think about it. Why do you like Victorian literature? And let me know, why do you like Victorian literature? And specifically, why do you like Charlotte Bronte? The Brontes are, of course, um, mandatory reading in a course on English literature or Victorian literature, at least one of the three, especially Charlotte or Emily, will feature in the syllabus. So there were um, three sisters, Charlotte, the oldest, the oldest of the surviving Brontes. There is a video here on YouTube in which I give you an introduction to the Brontes, and I talk to you about uh, the Bronte family, the two older siblings um, uh, that died when they were in boarding school at the ages of 10 and 11. I talk about their brother, Patrick Branwell. So if you haven't seen that video yet, um, please do. Um, here I will talk specifically about the three sisters. Charlotte was born in 1816 and died in 1855, so the one that lived the longest. Um, Emily, uh, was born in 1818 and died in 1848, very young. And Anne was born in 1820 and died in 1849, right after Emily. I also talk about this, um, well, this tragedy that befell the Bronte family in that introductory video. Um, these girls, Charlotte, Emily and Anne, they were northerners. They were born and raised in West Yorkshire in England. And they were, um, and they grew up in this isolation. Um, setting and landscape are very important for their works, especially Emily Bronte and Wuthering Heights. We discussed Wuthering Heights in a past workshop at Books and Culture. The moors, the wild moors, the kind of landscape um, that is harsh, barren, um, where the wind blows hard. That's where they were born around and that really influenced their writing and affected their social lives. They had barely none, uh, no social life. They lived in isolation. Um, but their window to the outside world was through books. Reading, reading gave them the key to unlock the world, if we think of it as a metaphor. Their father was a clergyman, uh, Patrick Bronte, and he was known for his progressive views on education and strong emphasis on learning. So they were quite lucky to have him, the girls were lucky to have him as a father. 
because he believed in the importance of learning, education, and books. And there were books around. Um, and this approach to learning influenced his children's intellectual development. Um, Patrick Bronte, the father, made efforts to provide books for his children, buying secondhand books and borrowing from local libraries. So even though they were physically isolated from the world, um, books provided this imaginary bridge to the outside world, present and past, and to education and to knowledge that really set them apart from um, what could be expected from country girls at the time. And they read a wide range of literature, classic literature, poetry, religious texts, and contemporary novels. And like I said, that's how they engaged with the outside world through the written word. Another interesting thing is that in this isolation, and because of all the books they've read, they had a very fertile imagination and they created their own fantasy worlds. The four of them, Charlotte, um, Patrick, the brother, um, Emily and Anne, they created uh, fantasy worlds. I'm not gonna talk about them um, in this, this is not the occasion, but it's so interesting to see the worlds they have created. And they created also poetry and short extracts of literature, pieces of literature, um, based on this world, these worlds, two worlds that they created. I'm going to talk about it in a course that I am already planning and studying for. It takes a lot of studying in order to, and dedication in order to create an online course, at least my courses in books and culture. So I'm slowly developing a course on the branches that should come out soon, hopefully. Let me know how you feel about it. And one of the lessons is about their imagined worlds. Um, regarding their literary achievements, um, Emily wrote poetry, beautiful poetry, very melancholy, dark. Um, if you ever get the chance to read some of her poetry, please do. We discussed some of her poems in our literary workshop on uh, Wuthering Heights. Some themes that are present in Wuthering Heights are all present <clears throat> in her early poetry. Um, and she wrote one novel, Wuthering Heights, that was published in 1847. Anne Bronte, the lesser known of the three, but nonetheless very, um, um, very significant, also did a very significant work, she published Agnes Grey. In 1847, it was in fact Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey were published in one a volume, three volumes. Um, Wuthering Heights divided into parts, volume one and two, followed by Agnes Grey in the same edition in 1847. And she also published The Tenant of Wildfell Hall in 1848. And this is a darker, more realistic work that deals with very heavy themes, especially at the time, such as violence, domestic abuse, um, alcoholism. So um, a bit different from, um, a bit heavier than uh, what the other Brontes wrote. A bit heavier in the realism of it. I mean, with Ray Heights is pretty heavy. <laughs> and uh, Charlotte Bronte wrote, uh, published three novels in her lifetime the masterpiece Jane Eyre in 1847 in a separate edition and from a different publisher than Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey. And in 1849, she published Shirley and in 1853, after the death of her sisters, Villette. So these three came out during her lifetime and the professor, the one we're reading today, we're starting today, was published posthumously in 1857. Perhaps you didn't know, but the professor was rejected by several publishers when it um, first appeared on the market. Let's say it was the first novel that Charlotte completed, but it was rejected. Um, and then she eventually published Jane Eyre first. Um, this was only published posthumously after her death then in 1857 with the permission of her husband. Um, 
Now, what is the professor about? The professor is loosely based on Charles' experience as a teacher in Brussels, in Belgium. Not many people know about this chapter in her life. Charlotte and Emily spent some time in Belgium to study French and also uh, to teach English uh, as a way to pay for their studies. And there, um, um, Charlotte acquired this experience that she would later explore in fiction in uh, The Professor. The protagonist, William Crimsworth, the, um, the protagonist in The Professor, is supposedly based on Charlotte's teacher in Belgium, Constantin Ege, founder of the Pensionnat Ege, where she worked, and the man with whom she fell in love, her early, perhaps first love for this married man, this authority figure, this intellectual man that really captured her heart and imagination, I would say. Um, you can see there's evidence of the feeling that she had, the feelings that she had for him in the correspondence correspondence that she exchanged with Ege. Um, but Ege kept a strictly professional relationship and um, um, yeah, cut <laughs> um, Charlotte's, let's say, attempts at, um, at a closer relationship. And much of the subject matter of the professor was later reworked from the perspective of the female teacher, which is quite interesting, in Bronte's later novel, Villette. And perhaps we can uh, read that together in another occasion, Villette. Um, so, how are you feeling about this project? Let's get it started. Today we're going to, uh, so I gave you a short introduction to, to the author, um, to the context in which she wrote, uh, to her experiences as a teacher that are represented in the book. Um, and now we're going to read the preface. So as you know, now, <laughs> Uh, the Professor was published posthumously, so uh, Charlotte never saw this in print. And the first edition was printed with this preface, um, written by Arthur Bell Nichols, Charlotte's husband. So let's take a look at what the preface says. This little book was written before either Jane Eyre or Shirley. And yet, no indulgence can be solicited for it on the plea of a first attempt. A first attempt it certainly was not, as the pen which wrote it had been previously worn a good deal in a practice of some years. I had not indeed published anything before I commenced The Professor, but in many a crude effort, destroyed almost as soon as I composed, I had got over any such taste as I might once have had for ornamented and redundant composition and come to prefer what was plain and homely. So this first part of the preface was written by Charlotte herself, right? And um, signed Kerr Bell. Um, it is widely known that the Brontes published under male pseudonyms because they wanted their fiction, their literature to be taken seriously. So their first publication was a collection of poems and they published under the pseudonyms Acton Bell, Kerr Bell and Alice Bell. So they kept their first, their, they kept their initials, for instance, A, B, um, and Bronte and Acton Bell, Charles, for instance, Charles Bronte, CB was Kerr Bell. Um, so this preface was also signed by Kerr Bell. So when she says here, this little book was written before Jane Eyre or Shirley, and yet no indulgence can be solicited for it on the plea of a first attempt, because it was not the first time that she had uh, attempted writing. Indeed, writing is something that she and her sisters had done since a very early age. So that was not her first attempt at writing. Um, uh, she says, I had not indeed published anything before I commenced The Professor, but in many a crude effort, destroyed almost as soon as I composed, I had got over my 
I had got over any such taste as I might once have had for ornamented and redundant composition and come to prefer what was plain and homely. So at that point in her writing, she had not completed anything yet. Um, she decided to give away the taste for ornamented and redundant composition, quite, uh, quite romantic from the romanticism approach to poetry, let it go and come to prefer what was plain and homely. So more in touch with her own time um, and the realist fiction that was being published, such as Elizabeth Gaskell, Charles Dickens, right? At the same time, I had adopted a set of principles on the subject of incident, etc., such as would be generally approved in theory, but the result of which, when carried out into practice, often procures for an author more surprise than pleasure. I said to myself that my hero should work his way through life as I had seen real living men work theirs, that he should never get a shilling he had not earned, that no sudden turns should lift him in a moment to wealth and high station, that whatever small competency he might gain should be won by the sweat of his brow, that before he could find so much as an arbor to sit down in, he should master at least half the ascent of the hill of difficulty, that he should not even marry a beautiful girl or a lady of rank. As Adam's son, he should share Adam's doom and drain throughout life a mixed and moderate cup of enjoyment. So there's a lot here. So she wanted a grounded, moral and realistic hero, not someone from a fairy tale or from a romantic uh, story in which coincidences out of uh, the blue and uh, make things go well for the, for, for the protagonist who marries a beautiful girl or um, sends them in a social rank. Um, uh, rises to high station, that would not happen because that's not what happens in real life. People only rise in, est in estimation, in affection, in rank, um, in wealth, is through their hard work and moral guidance. So that's what she wanted her protagonist in The Professor to be. In the sequel, however, I find that publishers in general scarcely approved of this system. So she was quite avant-garde, let's say. The publishers at the time did not want this kind of um, realistic, ordinary hero. They wanted a fantastic, extraordinary hero. And that's not what she gives here in this story. As she says, I find that publishers in general scarcely approved of this system, but would have liked something more imaginative and poetical, something more consonant with a highly wrought fancy, with a taste for pathos, with sentiments more tender, elevated, unworldly. And with this choice of words, she's relating to, she's referring to romanticism, right? That's what was, um, she probably wrote this, um, uh, well, prior to, to Jane Eyre, so in the first half of the century. So a lot of traces of romanticism were still uh, visible and still popular in the market. And that's, well, publishers want what will sell. And they thought that the professor would not sell. Indeed, until an author has tried to dispose of a manuscript of this kind, he can never know what stores of romance and sensibility lie hidden in breasts he would not have suspected of casketing such treasures. Men in business are usually thought to prefer the real. On trial, the idea will be often found fallacious. A passionate preference for the wild, wonderful and thrilling, the strange, startling and harrowing, agitates diverse souls that show a calm and sober surface. Such being the case, the reader will comprehend that to have reached him in the form of a printed book, this brief narrative must have gone through some struggles, which indeed it has. And after all, its worst struggle and strongest ordeal is yet to come, but it takes comfort, subdues fear, leans on the staff of a moderate expectation, and mutters under its breath while lifting its eye to that of the public. He that is low need fear no fall. Kerbel. So she brings this text to the public, as she said, as she uh, well prepared it for publication, but it was never accepted. Um, she shows it with a moderate expectation. 
Um, and after this, oops, preface, there is um, a note from her husband, Arthur Bell Nichols, um, dated September 22nd, 1856. So that is after Charlotte's death. He writes the following. The foregoing preface was written by my wife with a view to the publication of the professor shortly after the appearance of Shirley. So after she published Jane Eyre and Shirley, she had prepared this for publication. Um, being dissuaded from her intention, the authoress made some use of the materials in a subsequent work, Villette, as I mentioned. As, however, these two stories are in most respects unlike, it has been represented to me that I ought not to withhold the professor from the public. I have therefore consented to its publication. So after Charlotte's death, the manuscript becomes Arthur's possession, property, and he consents to the publication in 1850. So he wrote this preface, um, this comment to the preface, addendum to the preface in 1856, and um, the book came out the following year, 1857. So, how do you feel? I like to know. Um, it's important to read the paratexts. Paratexts meaning whatever accompanies the text, but that is not part of the main narrative. For instance, a preface, an introduction, an illustration, title page, they do not affect the main narrative, but they do affect the way that readers experience the text. So it's nice to know this. It's very interesting to know this, the, um, the context of publication. And now we'll get to the book itself, chapter one, um, and let's read it together and let's discuss it. If you have any questions along the way, please write them in the chat. All right, chapter one, introductory. The other day, in looking over my papers, I found in my desk the following copy of a letter sent by me a year since to an old school acquaintance. First of all, we can already tell that what is the narrative style? <laughs> it's a first person narrative. So it's a first person character. So someone who is part of the story is telling their own story. And um, they begin by referring to a letter sent by himself to an old school acquaintance and that he copied. So let's read the letter. Dear Charles, I think when you and I were at Eton together, we were neither of us what could be called popular characters. You were a sarcastic, observant, shrewd, cold-blooded creature. My own portrait I will not attempt to draw, but I cannot recollect that it was a strikingly attractive one. Can you? What animal magnetism drew thee and me together, I know not. Certainly I never experienced anything of the Pilates and Orestes sentiment for you, and I have reason to believe that you, on your part, were equally free from all romantic regard to me. Still, out of school hours, we walked and talked continually together. When the theme of conversation was our companions or our masters, we understood each other. And when I recurred to some sentiment of affection, some vague love of an excellent or beautiful object, whether inanimate or inanimate nature, your sardonic coldness did not move me. I felt myself superior to that check then as I do now. It is long time since I wrote to you and a still longer time since I saw you. Chancing to take up a newspaper of your county the other day, my eye fell upon your name. I began to think of old times, to run over the events which have transpired since we separated, and I sat down and commenced this letter. What you have been doing, I know not, but you shall hear, if you choose to listen, how the world has wagged with me. First, after leaving Eton, I had an interview with my maternal uncles, Lord Tyndale and the Honorable John Seacombe. They asked me if I would enter the church, and my uncle, the nobleman, offered me the living of Seacombe, which is in his gift, if I would. Then my other uncle, Mr. Seacombe, hinted that when I became rector of Seacombe Comscaife, 
I might perhaps be allowed to take, as mistress of my house and head of my parish, one of my six cousins, his daughters, all of whom I greatly dislike. So, a little pause here. We see here a very common Victorian, yeah, even earlier, mindset, right? So, there is this man who, after finishing his studies at Eton, doesn't know what to do. So, the high or noble people in his family, so his maternal uncles, the wealthy ones, they suggest that he uh, enters the church. So the church was one of the acceptable professions for um, a man of a certain rank at the time. It reminds me, perhaps you also think of that, of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility and um, Edward, um, who wanted to do something else with his life, remember? And he was not allowed by his family. He could either, he had some options, either the church or, uh, what was it? The Navy or the law, if I'm not mistaken. Those were the acceptable outcomes for a gentleman. Never, never ever trade. That will corrupt your uh, your noble blood, Edward Ferris from uh, Sense and Sensibility. So there's a similar thing going on here with our protagonist. So he was um, given the chance by his wealthy maternal uncles to enter the church and to take, as if a property, one of his cousins as a wife, any of the cousins. I declined both the church and matrimony. A good clergyman is a good thing but I should have made a very bad one. As to the wife, oh, how like a nightmare is the thought of being bound for life to one of my cousins. No doubt they are accomplished and pretty, but not an accomplishment, not a charm of theirs touches a chord in my bosom. To think of passing the winter evenings by the parlor fireside of Seacombe Rectory alone with one of them, for instance, the large and well-modeled statute, Sarah, no, I should be a bad husband under such circumstances, as well as a bad clergyman. When I had declined my uncle's offers, they asked me what I intended to do. I said I should reflect. They reminded me that I had no fortune and no expectation of any, and after a considerable pause, Lord Tyndale demanded sternly whether I had thoughts of following my father's steps and engaging in trade. Now, I had had no thoughts of the sort. I do not think that my turn of mind qualifies me to make a good tradesman. My taste, my ambition does not lie in that way. But such was the scorn expressed in Lord Tinsdale's countenance as he pronounced the word trade, such the contemptuous sarcasm of his tone, that I was instantly decided. My father was but a name to me, yet that name I did not like to hear mentioned with a sneer to my very face. I answer them with haste and warmth. I cannot do better than follow in my father's steps. Yes, I will be a tradesman. My uncles did not remonstrate. They and I parted with mutual disgust. Because he had chosen, he had chosen the trade, the life of a simple man, a tradesman, in, um, in place of being a, ch a churchman, a clergyman. So they separate, they broke connections. And in fact, he didn't even want to be a tradesman. But just because the way they mentioned that and mentioned his father in such a contemptuous way, that disgusted him. And he all of a sudden decided, just out of um, uh, contempt, just to, um, to oppose his uncles, to yes, enter the trade. In reviewing this transaction, I find that I was quite right to shake off the burden of Tyndale's patronage, but a fool to offer my shoulders instantly for the reception of another burden, one which might be more intolerable and which certainly was yet untried. I wrote instantly to Edward. You know Edward, my only brother, ten years my senior, married to a rich mill owner's daughter, and now possessor of the mill and business which was my father's before he failed. You are aware that my father once reckoned a crisis of wealth, 
became bankrupt a short time previous to his death and that my mother lived in destitution for some six months after him, unhelped by her aristocratic brothers, whom she had mortally offended by her union with Crimsworth, the Shire manufacturer. At the end of the six months, she brought me into the world and then herself left it without, I should think, much regret, as it contained little hope or comfort for her. Now we have a, a, a glimpse at, at his family situation, right? So we know that his father was in trade, although his father was put a name to him, so they didn't have a close relationship. Um, we also know that he has an older brother, Edward, 10 years his senior, and that followed the footsteps of his father in trade and is a successful man now. Um, and he talks about his mother in a way that shows his remonstrance of his um, uncles, his maternal uncles, so the brothers of his mother who shunned her and let her and uh, let her leave, live in destitution after uh, she decided to marry a tradesman, which they did not approve of. So they did not help her um, financially. And after their father went bankrupt, um, she, uh, she lived still six months after the death of, of uh, her husband. And after six months, when um, our protagonist was only a baby, she, the mother, left the world without much regret as it contained little hope or comfort for, for her. So we know that the protagonist, William, has only his brother left. The father died bankrupt. The mother died destitute and alone and abandoned. And um, he was left alone at the age of six months with his older brother. Um, now let's see what else he can tell us about life with his brother. My father's relations took charge of Edward as they did of me till I was nine years old. At that period, it chanced that the representation of an important borough in our county fell vacant. Mr. Seacombe stood for it. My uncle Crimsworth, an astute mercantile man, took the opportunity of writing a fierce letter to the candidate, stating that if he and Lord Tyndale did not consent to do something towards the support of their sister's orphan children, he would expose their relentless and malignant conduct towards that sister and do his best to turn the circumstances against Mr. Seacombe's election. That gentleman and Lord T knew well enough that the Crimsworths were an unscrupulous and determined race. They knew also that they had influence in the borough of X. So she does not uh, write the names of locations, so she just adds an X. And making a virtue of necessity, they consented to defray the expenses of my education. That was sent to Eton, where I remained 10 years, during which space of time Edward and I never met. So, of course, Eton is an expensive education for gentlemen, uh, mainly. So how did he end up there, having been abandoned by his parents and uh, uh, given the fact that his father had gone bankrupt? So one of his paternal uncles got in touch with the wealthy relatives in his mother's side and um, used some emotional blackmailing to um, convince convince them to offer support to their sister's children. And then in that way, they paid for William's education at Eton for 10 years. And during this time, he and Edward, the brother Edward, never met. He, Edward, when he grew up, entered into trade and pursued his calling with such diligence, ability and success that now in his 30th year, he was fast making a fortune. Of this, I was apprised by the occasional short letters I received from him some three or four times a year, which said letters never concluded without some expression of determined enmity against the house of Seacombe and some reproach to me for living, as he said, on the bounty of that house. So they didn't have a good relationship because the brother Edward resented that um, William was living under the protection of their mother's brothers who had been so harsh to their mother. So he does not approve this relationship. At first, 
when while still in boyhood, I could not understand why, as I had no parents, I should not be indebted to my uncles, Tyndale and Seacom for my education. But as I grew up and heard by degrees of the persevering hostility, the hatred till death evinced by them against my father, of the sufferings of my mother, of all the wrongs in short of our house, then did I conceive shame of the dependence in which I lived and form a resolution no more to take bread from hands which had refused to minister to the necessities of my dying mother. It was by these feelings I was influenced when I refused the rectory of Seacombe and the union with one of my patrician cousins. An irreparable breach thus being effected between my uncles and myself, I wrote to Edward, told him what had occurred and informed him of my intention to follow his steps and be a tradesman. I asked, moreover, if he could give me employment. His answer expressed no approbation of my conduct, but he said I might come down to Shire if I liked, and he would see what could be done in the way of furnishing with me with work. I repressed all, even mental, comment on his note, packed my trunk and carpet bag, and started for the north directly. Um, so now we know that he broke with his um, maternal uncles, and in that way he uh, reconciled with his brother, who is a successful businessman at the moment, and he leaves his house, or where he's staying, to um, live with his brother and hopefully work with him. After two days traveling, railroads were not then in existence. I arrived one wet October afternoon in the town of X. I had always understood that Edward lived in this town, but on inquiry, I found that it was only Mr. Crimsworth's mill and warehouse which were situated in the smoky atmosphere of Big Ben Close. His residence lay four miles out in the country. It was late in the evening when I alighted at the gates of the habitation designed to me as my brothers. As I advanced up the avenue, I could see through the shades of twilight and the dark gloomy mists which deepened those shades that the house was large and the ground surrounding it sufficiently spacious. I paused a moment on the lawn in front and leaning my back against a tall tree which rose in the center, I gazed with interest on the exterior of Crimsworth Hall. So in a way, Crimsworth Hall, <laughs> um, his brother's residence, the very big mansion, um, does not come from status, from a noble birth, from an old name. No, this fortune he built out of trade. And that was scorned by those people from the old aristocracy, such as the uncles Tinsdale and Seacombe. Um, nonetheless, money is money, fortune is fortune. And, um, and William is very surprised to see that his brother has such a lavish lifestyle. Edward is rich, thought I to myself. I believed him to be doing well, but I did not know he was master of a mansion like this. Cutting short all marveling, speculation, conjecture, etc., I advanced to the front door and rang. A manservant opened it. I announced myself. He relieved me of my wet cloak and carpet bag and ushered me into a room furnished as a library where there was a bright fire and candles burning on the table. He informed me that his master was not yet returned from X market, but that he would certainly be at home in the course of half an hour. Being left to myself, I took the stuffed easy chair covered with red Morocco, which stood by the fireside, and while my eyes watched the flames dart from the glowing coals and the cinders fall at intervals on the hearth, my mind busied itself in conjectures concerning the meeting about to take place. Remember, they hadn't seen each other for ten years. Amidst much that was doubtful in the subject of these conjectures, there was one thing tolerably certain. I was in no danger of encountering severe disappointment. From this, the moderation of my expectations guaranteed me. I anticipated no overflowings of fraternal tenderness. Edward's letters had always been such as to prevent the engendering or harboring of delusions of the sort. Still, as I sat awaiting his arrival, I felt eager, very eager, I cannot tell you why, 
My hand, so utterly estranged to the grasp of a kindred hand, clenched itself to repress the tremor with which impatience would fain have shaken it. I thought of my uncle's, and as I was engaged in wondering whether Edward's indifference would equal the cold disdain I had always experienced from them, I heard the avenue gates open. Wheels approached the house. Mr. Crimsworth was arrived, and after the lapse of some minutes and a brief dialogue between himself and his servants in the hall, his tread drew near the library door. That tread alone announced the master of the house. I still retain some confused recollection of Edward as he was 10 years ago, a tall, wiry, raw youth. Now, as I rose from my seat and turned towards the library door, I saw a fine-looking and powerful man, light-complexioned, well-made, and of athletic proportions. The first glance made me aware of an air of promptitude and sharpness, shown as well in his movements as in his sport, his eye, and the general expression of his face. He greeted me with brevity, and in the moment of shaking hands, scanned me from head to foot. He took his seat in the morocco covered armchair and motioned me to another seat. So they meet again after 10 years. He still had that recollection of his brother as a boy 10 years previously, but now he sees a man, right, a confident man. I expected you would have called at the counting house in the close, said he, and his voice, I noticed, had an abrupt accent, probably habitual to him. He spoke also with a guttural northern tone, which sounded harsh in my ears, accustomed to the silvery utterance of the south. The landlord of the inn, where the coach stopped, directed me here, said I. I doubted at first the accuracy of his information, not being aware that you had such a residence as this. Oh, it is all right, he replied. Only I was kept half an hour behind time waiting for you, that is all. I thought you must be coming by the eight o'clock coach. I expressed regret that he had had to wait. He made no answer, but stirred the fire as if to cover a movement of impatience. Then he scanned me again. I felt an inward satisfaction that I had not, in the first moment of meeting, betrayed any warmth, any enthusiasm, that I had saluted this man with a quiet and steady phlegm. Have you quite broken with Tyndale and Seacombe? He asked hastily. I do not think I shall have any further communication with them. My refusal of their proposals will, I fancy, operate as a barrier against all future intercourse. Why, said he, I may as well remind you at the very outset of our connection that no man can serve two masters. Acquaintance with Lord Tyndale will be incompatible with assistance from me. There was a kind of gratuitous menace in his eye as he looked at me in finishing this observation. So he, Edward wanted to make sure that William had broken with his maternal uncles. Only then could Edward propose or offer to help him. Feeling no disposition to reply to him, I contented myself with an inward speculation on the differences which exist in the constitution of men's minds. I do not know what inference Mr. Crimsworth drew from my silence, whether he considered it a symptom of contumacity or an evidence of my being cowed by his peremptory manner. After a long and hard stare at me, he rose sharply from his seat. Tomorrow, said he, I shall call your attention to some other points, but now it is supper time and Mrs. Crimsworth is probably waiting. Will you come? He strode from the room and I followed. In crossing the hall, I wondered what Mrs. Crimsworth might be. Is she, thought I, as alien to what I like as Tyndale Seacombe, the Mrs. Seacombe, and the affectionate relative now striding before me? Or is she better than these? Shall I, in conversing with her, feel free to show, to show something of my real nature? Or further conjectures were arrested by my entrance into the dining room. You can you can get the feeling of how alone he is, right? He has no kindred hand, like he mentioned earlier. So he cannot be himself with anyone. And he wonders if this woman, Mrs. Grimsworth, is finally going to be someone uh, to whom he can be just himself. A lamp 
Bernie, under a shade of ground glass, showed a handsome apartment, wainscoted with oak. Supper was laid on the table by the fireplace, standing as if waiting our entrance. Appeared a lady. She was young, tall, and well-shaped. Her dress was handsome and fashionable. So much my first glance sufficed to ascertain. A gay salutation passed between her and Mr. Crimsworth. She chid him, half playfully, half poutingly, for being late. Her voice, I always take voices into the account in judging of character, was lively. It indicated, I thought, good animal spirits. Mr. Crimsworth soon checked her animated scolding with a kiss. A kiss that still told of the bridegroom, they had not yet been married a year. She took her seat at the supper table in first-rate spirits. Perceiving me, she begged my pardon for not noticing me before, and then shook hands with me, as ladies do when a flow of good humor disposes them to be cheerful to all, even the most indifferent of their acquaintance. It was now further obvious to me that she had a good complexion and features sufficiently marked but agreeable. Her hair was red, quite red. She and Edward talked much, always in a vein of playful contention. She was vexed, or pretended to be vexed, that he had that day driven a vicious horse in the gig, and he made light of her fears. Sometimes she appealed to me. Now, Mr. William, isn't it absurd in Edward to talk so? He says he will drive Jack and no other horse, and the brute has thrown him twice already. She spoke with a kind of lisp, not disagreeable, but childish. I soon saw also that there was more than girlish, a somewhat infantine expression in her by no means by her in her by no means small features. This lisp and expression were, I have no doubt, a charm in Edward's eyes, and would be so to those of most men, but they were not to mine. I sought her eye, desirous to read there the intelligence which I could not discern in her face or hear in her conversation. It was merry, rather small. By turns I saw vivacity, vanity, coquetry, look out through its arid, but I watched in vain for a glimpse of soul. I am no oriental. White necks, carmine lips and cheeks, clusters of bright curls do not suffice for me without that Promethean spark which will live after the roses and lilies are faded. The burnished hair grown gray. In sunshine, in prosperity, the flowers are very well, but how many wet days are there in life? November seasons of disaster, when a man's hearth and home would be cold indeed without the clear, cheering gleam of intellect. So he favors intellect. Intellect is important in him. That's why he had decided to not follow the, um, the profession of clergyman, because he said his intellectual ambitions wanted more. And now he sees this woman and he had thought that maybe she could be someone with whom he could be just himself. But he sought, he looked and he looked, but he saw no soul in her, no intellect. And yes, Beauty is good. I mean, it is to, to most men, in fact, but does not suffice to him without that Promethean spark. Now, here he refers to the god Prometheus. Prometheus in uh, mythology was the one who stole fire from the gods to create mankind. That's why Frankenstein is called the modern Prometheus, right? Um, so he needed, he, he, he saw that she lacked that fire to create, that fire of knowledge, that fire of intellect. Having perused the fair page of Mrs. Crimsworth's face, a deep involuntary sigh announced my disappointment. She took it as a homage to her beauty, and Edward, who was evidently proud of his rich and handsome young wife, threw on me a glance, half ridicule, half ire. I turned from them both, and gazing wearily round the room, I saw two pictures set in the oak panelling, one on each side of the mantelpiece. Ceasing to take part in the bantering conversation that flowed on between Mr. and Mrs. Crimsworth, I bent my thoughts to the examination of these pictures. They were portraits, a lady and a gentleman, both costumed in the fashion of 20 years ago. The gentleman was in the shade, I could not see him well, the lady had the benefit of a full beam from the softly shaded lamp. I presently recognized her. 
I had seen this picture before in childhood. It was my mother. That and the companion picture being the only heirloom saved out of the sale of my father's property. The face, his mother's face, the face I remembered had pleased me as a boy, but then I did not understand it. Now I knew how rare that class of face is in the world, and I appreciated keenly its thoughtful yet gentle expression. The serious gray eye possessed for me a strong charm, as did certain lines in the features indicative of most true and tender feelings. I was sorry it was only a picture. So what he saw lacking in Mrs. Crimsworth, now that he sees his mother's portrait, he sees it there, and he feels sorry that it was only a picture, that she was not there in person. I soon left Mr. and Mrs. Crimsworth to themselves. A servant conducted me to my bedroom. In closing my chamber door, I shut out all intruders, you, Charles, as well as the rest. Goodbye for the present, William Crimsworth. So this is the letter that he had written to his uh, old acquaintance, this uh, Charles, right? And that he had copied down. To this letter, I never got an answer. Before my old friend received it, he had accepted a government appointment in one of the colonies and was already on his way to the scene of his official labors. What has become of him since, I know not. The leisure time I have at command, and which I intended to employ for his private benefit, I shall now dedicate to that of the public at large. My narrative is not exciting, and above all, not marvelous but it may interest some individuals who, having toiled in the same vocation as myself, will find in my experience frequent reflections of their own. The above letter will serve as an introduction. I now proceed. And that's the end of chapter one. So what he started as an exercise, let's say, of recollection, um, because he wanted to uh, send this letter to his friend, to update him on his life, what he has been doing this past years. Um, although his friend never got the letter, this exercise of writing this letter prompted him to continue thinking about his life and writing his memoirs. Now, not only for his friend, Charles, but to the wider public. And that is what the rest of the book is. So we may wonder, what is the use of Charles? Um, after all, <laughs> but we'll talk about it as we progress uh, with the novel. So I hope you enjoyed this beginning to the project, the introduction to the novel, a short um, overview of the Brontes and Charlotte's writing, and the preface and chapter one. And next time, so next week, that will be February the 15th, uh, Thursday, we're going to read chapters two, three, and four. Read it together, read them together, and discuss them together. Um, so I hope to see you next time, and have a wonderful time reading The Professor with me. Bye!